I, I, had, I was blessed once to interview the man who started Habitat for Humanity. He's passed since. But he, he would always give every family who they gave a house to a small little wooden house piggy. And I'd say, well, why are you giving them a piggy bank? If they had money, they would have built their own house. And he'd smile and he'd very knowingly say, they have a right to give too. All right, hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here. Hey, welcome to the Dr. Axe Show. So excited to have Dr. Oz on here with us today. Uh, I know that I've been on the sh show a few times, but I'm sure all of you know uh, Dr. Oz, and uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. Uh, you've done such an amazing job of teaching the public uh, so many things, you know, the benefits of herbs, the benefits of spices, the benefit of superfoods, and just how to take care of our health naturally through lifestyle. And so I want to say, hey, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I feel the same about you as evidenced by the fact I keep inviting you on, torturing you to fly out to New York. <laughs> you do a fantastic job. I, I read your work frequently online as well. So kudos to you. Awesome. Hey, thanks. I'm honored. And uh, I always love coming on the show. It doubles as a trip to New York, which my wife loves. We have so many of our favorite restaurants are there in NYC. So it's, uh, it's always a good time. But hey, well, I'd love to dive in. You know, you, I know right now you're doing the interview from the hospital. Um, and what hospital are you at? New York Presbyterian, Columbia University. I'm, I've been on the faculty at Columbia for since 1993. It's a long time ago. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> and I, I know what's so different for you is, you know, you've really early on adopted this, uh, really when the studies were first coming out. And that's one of the things I respect about you so much is a lot of times, I saw this study recently that said a lot of doctors in practice, it takes them 15 to 18 years on average before they're adopting what a lot of the medical literature says. But you very early on picked up recommending things like turmeric and, and talking about things like fish oil. What really got you turned on to you know, natural medicine and some of these more nutritional uh, ways of getting healthy? Well, it started here at the hospital. You know, patients who were coming to see me had issues that I couldn't address that uh, effectively with traditional medicine. Uh, I was trained at you know, up and down the East Coast at Harvard and Penn. I mean, I, went, I had a pretty traditional background, so it certainly wasn't what I was taught. I was influenced in a big uh, way by my wife, whose family has been for many years interested in alternative and holistic approaches. In fact, my father-in-law is a very famous heart surgeon, and he was influenced by my mother-in-law, who kept saying, listen, you know, these herbs in the garden have an impact. Or, you know, your patient's who's got hepatitis, maybe they'll benefit from high-dose vitamin C. Here's a paper from Japan. And they, so she started pulling all the papers uh, literally hanging him back then, you know, Xerox copies and stuff. And he began to read it and say, you know, there's a lot of wisdom out there that we haven't been exposed to. So when I went into practice, I would always call my father-in-law for advice because I'm a heart surgeon. I'd say, you know, I, I, here, I actually, literally, this is the heart next to me in my office. So <laughs> I've got a heart and I've got to cut this valve out and how do I do it? And, and he'd walk me through it. And while I was saying that, he'd also point out that there are some additional things that might be beneficial to my uh, my patients, like, you know, you throw some CoQ10 in there and maybe it benefits the ability for the heart to bounce back after you've stopped it for two hours to fix it. And these are things that we had trouble proving because they were always coming from other backgrounds, other traditions. But after a while, your patients, you know, if you're asked, if you're listening to them, will begin to reinforce certain ideas and not others. And then I said, okay, well, it's, if it's true for things I can put in their mouth, what about things I can put in their ears or um, on their bodies? For example, audio therapy. Could I put music tapes in uh, in the operating room, because I listen to music in the operating room, maybe the patients would not want my music, maybe they want their own music. And then I'd ask them, they should not have preferences. Or I'd give them massage therapy, which we would do, and notice that they would urinate, which is a good thing because everyone's waterlogged after surgery because of the trauma, natural human uh, hormonal response. But if I can get you to pee out by massaging your legs, then I don't have to give you a water pill, that's better. Because now I'm not forcing your kidneys to do something they may not want to do. And that began a large, a long cascade of research into these alternative approaches, uh, which in many ways catalyzed my career in media. Because doing television was not on my vision board, Josh. I don't know if wow. anyone knew, but I had no intention of doing television. Yeah. I mean, I love this too. And I just want to say too, uh, you know, I, I love just the spirit behind why you went about things. Again, having a humble, teachable spirit, really going out there and just being a learner and applying these things and listening to patients. I think, you know, these are things that really make such a difference. Uh, I love it. I never knew that. I never knew that story. That's awesome. Um, another question. So for everyone out there who's saying, okay, I want to know where to start. Like, what are the Let's, let's go through two things. One, what are the worst things people can put in their body? And then on the other hand, what are the best things just for, the gen, for somebody generally speaking that they can start, start eating? 
Well, it does, it does depend a little bit on your genes. Whatever your weaknesses are, they need to be taken into consideration. For example, I'm a heart surgeon. So if you've got a heart problem and you're in my office, my focus on you will be more about factors that may influence cholesterol levels. Uh, certainly B vitamins, for example, tend to be beneficial in some people who have cardiovascular disease, avoids things like homocysteine abnormalities. So that's sort of one, one category. But if your big issue is Alzheimer's, well, maybe omega-3 fats are a bigger issue for you. And if you genetically are predisposed to it, I would definitely add B12 and folate to your diet. Um, and if your issue is cancer, maybe it's much more about leafy greens and in particular uh, plants that we think might be like Reiki mushrooms uh, that we believe are beneficial in, in helping your immune system. But across the board, if I want to answer that question, shotgunning it, lean green, eat foods that come out of the ground, look in the way they look when you eat them. If you do that, you get all the nutrients that these plants are harvesting from the soil and from the sun to protect themselves against illness. You get it on your own body. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't have a war on meat, uh, although I know that processed meat, fried produce, uh, are, are prob- are, and f- foods are problematic. Um, so if, if we try to put numbers on these things using the real age test, which is a system that was designed by Mike Royzen, my book writing partner, who's at the, he's a chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic. And the real age test said, hey, listen, we're going to treat you like an adult. We're going to tell you what we think is most important and least important for you. And so, for example, smoking a cigarette takes 10 years off your life. Uh, eating a lot of saturated and fatty foods, devastatingly important, measured in several years of life lost. Uh, meat, eating meat, maybe you lose a year. And so you sort of work, walk up and down that scale and you pick a, what's most important for you. Then you can make decisions about what you're going to replace for something else. Example. Wine doesn't seem to hurt you, may even help you a little bit. So if you want to replace your cigarettes with a little alcohol, wine specifically, without getting intoxicated, it's a pretty good trade. So you're trading one vice for another theoretical vice, which doesn't turn out to penalize your body that much. Mm. Yeah, one of the things I love about what you're sharing here too, just starting off too, is this uh, principle of personalized medicine. I think, you know, you and I are both reading, this is where a lot of things are moving to in the future. But also the thing I love about it is it's going way back because if you look at traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, it was so much based on, I mean, they had things like the doshas and the five elements, but it was so personalized. And so I I love that recommendation. It's fantastic. Uh, So what are some of your favorite foods? Like if you're saying, okay, here are, so you mentioned green leafy vegetables. Are there a couple others you would say, uh, let's talk about maybe specifically the heart and brain that you absolutely love. So my favorite without question are nuts, which I always take with me wherever I am. Uh, Nuts and seeds. I mean, these are going to be trees, right? So they, they contain the nutrients that it requires to grow a tree. Basically, they're plant eggs. And so I love having them as part of my routine. Plus, they're easy to cart around. And I'm not oblivious to the reality that if you don't like it, you won't do it. Yeah. So the most important message I would ever give anybody is don't eat a diet because it's healthy. Eat it because you love it and it happens to be healthy. If you keep that in the back of your mind, you'll do just fine. So with that as, as a guidance, I'd say, okay, all the leafy greens are great. Uh, every plant uh, that you enjoy pretty much you can get away with. Some are especially good garlic, the allium plants, you know, leeks, garlic, artichoke, these are particularly valuable. Um, I, I think there's a value to fruits, although not as much as, as plants, but fruits, uh, you know, or, or vegetables rather. Fruits I, I, I adore. You can get the ones that are a little less sweet if you want to make it consistent part of your diet. So it's plants. It's maybe, you know, things, the less sugary fruits like berries. It's a lot of the herbs and spices, the things you talked about. By the way, just talking about your daughter quick. I mean, how did she become such a great chef? Did you, did you teach her everything she knows or? Believe me, I can't even boil water, Josh. It's from my wife. <laughs> My wife is a great chef. She has a New York Times bestselling cookbook, actually. She has more bestselling books than I do. How many people can say that in their family? Wow, that's amazing. Um, but I, uh, I've always respected her ability to make – she's vegetarian, has been her entire life. And she has the ability to make vegetables taste fabulous. So she taught Daphne that you don't have to crutch on uh, super high-quality meat to be, in order to make a meal that the entire family adores. Daphne started off uh, – she went to Princeton – and as she graduated, she was recruited to work for a job in media and hit it off with everybody. And then she was offered the position uh, on The Chew. Yeah. It was a great cooking show with a bunch of wonderful chefs. And, you know, she, over the last year, she's been making a show on Wednesdays for me. It airs in place of my Wednesday afternoon show, the part, second half of it, called The Dish. That's and, right. I've seen it. Yeah. So uh, Vanessa Williams is her co-host. A uh, couple of great stars that are working with her on that. And it's a, it's a fabulous show. Yeah, my wife Chelsea and I have watched it. We love it. It was fantastic. You got to be a proud dad uh, right there. So good. 
Um, let's talk about what you actually, I want to talk about stress for a minute because especially being a cardiologist, I, I feel like this is such a big thing. So talk to me about, okay, we've talked about diet some, talk about the role stress plays in our overall health. It's the hidden risk factor and people express it in different ways. Not all stress is equal. Uh, when I do heart surgery, it's stressful, but it doesn't tax me. I sort of thrive on that stress. It's like playing, a, if you like playing tennis on the weekends with your friends, you know, it's, it's a sport. Uh, that might get you stressed out or playing a musical instrument in front of other people or public speaking. These are all stressful events, but they can be exhilarating at the same time. The problem with stress is when it isolates you and at the same time, you can't cope with it well. And in, this, in our society, our real epidemic, Josh, I, I wonder if you agree with this, is, is, is loneliness, isolation. Yeah. If you don't feel like we're a raindrop falling into the ocean of humanity, we be, then we feel like we're alone. We're out there listless. So for a lot of people, stress is about getting past the issues day to day in life, but at the same time, respecting the reality that uh, your coping skills are up to you. You can get other people to help you, but you gotta manage it yourself. Uh, and that's why I always focus not so much on changing the world around you when you're stressed, but changing who you are so you can cope with that world around you. Yeah, I mean, I love that. It's such good advice, and I think for so many people, and we live in a world today where relationships are more shallow than ever due to social media. I mean, people are spending, I, mean, I, I, I thought about this the other day, you know, when we're, I was on a flight and just thinking every person is on a, on a phone when I remember I flew on a trip to China. This was like 14 years ago. I was on a kind of a mission trip going over there, and I talked to people for like 20 hours, you know, it just, you know, people don't, aren't connecting, but I, I agree with that. I mean, loneliness uh, is really so connected, especially to depression. It's a, uh, it, it's a big deal. What, what do the you mission, do? Go, go ahead. The mission trip you're on, what was it for? Uh, actually, it was a medical mission trip slash Christian mission trip. So we went over there, we brought Bibles, we brought shoes, actually a company donated shoes, but we also did a, yeah, it was more of a medical mission trip. We brought vitamin C, supplements, that type of thing. See, but that in itself is so important for your personal longevity and the people who are joining you. And I, I, have, I was blessed once to interview the man who started Habitat for Humanity. He's passed since. But he, he would always give every family who they gave a house to a small little wooden house piggy bank. Mm. And I'd say, well, why are you giving them a piggy bank? If they had money, they would have built their own house. And he'd smile and he'd very knowingly say, they have a right to give too. Mm. The power of being able to help others is immense. We know there's longevity data supporting that benefit. And so it's not, it's, of course, you're doing it altruistically. You want to help folks, but you tend to, all of us who try to do that kind of work tend to benefit as well. But it's, it's so powerful that this gentleman would, would put it in people's homes. And I, re, I applaud you for doing it. And it's fantastic because it reminds all of us that the ultimate fabric, the safety net of each of us uh, in our lives and people around us. Yeah, you know, the other thing too, anytime I've done that over the years, I, I've always come back feeling like I see a bigger picture. Like it's not, it's not about me and my own comfort. People all over the world have nothing. And so it really, uh, it does. It, it really changes your perspective. It's a big perspective change. Um, a few other things I'd love to know about sort of your personal life. So I love hearing that, you know, your wife is, uh, you know, loves cooking and, and gardening and those types of things. Talk to me about like, what is your personal diet look like? I saw the nuts. Like what, what do you have for breakfast? What, what do you, you know, what do you love that your wife cooks? So I'll eat whatever Lisa makes, but here's a, yeah. a typical meal that I'll have. Uh, and during the weekdays, I make shows uh, most days. So, or I'm at the hospital. So I bring my food with me. So I'll be yogurt, 2% Greek yogurt with some berries. And uh, that just tends to hit the spot for me. But I don't eat it when I first get up. And I don't really drink coffee. So I get up in the morning, do a little yoga, just like 10 minutes, not more. Uh, some, some water with ideally some little lemon juice in it, but it could just be water. That's an old Ayurvedic approach to get your gastric juices going. Then about two hours later, I'll have a little yogurt with my berries. And then I'll tape the first show. And then I'll have a big lunch. You know, maybe it's salmon, salad, um, you know, whatever, whatever. It's not kielbasa. Not having pork <laughs> ones, usually. Yeah. And, and then, um, then in the middle of the afternoon, I'll have a little piece of chocolate. Or if I, was, if I, if I ever drink coffee, that's about when I'll get a little bit. Because it just, just, But the best thing I do in the middle of the afternoon is to nap. I know it's not a food. You asked me about foods. But yeah, nap, just 10 minutes is so valuable for me. Uh, and it refreshes me and it gets me energetically back into making what I'm going to do. Second case of the day, second uh, taping of the day, whatever it is. And then I'll eat dinner around 6. I try to eat early. Uh, I don't purposely intermittent fast, but effectively that's what I'm doing. 
So I'll finish eating and I won't eat much more after seven and I'll have breakfast around you know, eight, eight, eight thirty in that range. So it gives me a little bit more than 12 hours without food in my stomach, which I think is good for rebalancing me. And that's, that's my basic day. Now, some may say I have joyless eating, but I'm going to admit it right here. If I'm out with friends or if there's something going on that's nice, there's nothing healthier than laughing with you, with the people you care about. So I'll always eat the cake and the pork loin or whatever they're giving me. I'm not the barbecue. I'm not going to go to a barbecue joint and have the coleslaw. Yeah. I'll, I'll eat the food. <laughs> but my norm, you know, nine out of 10 times each, just like I described. And you know, I don't do it to live longer. I do it because I feel better in that moment. Yeah. That's good. I love that. You know, similar thing, Chelsea and I, we went to uh, Italy last year and uh, Chelsea loved it. We went to Florence and I mean, it's so funny, like social media, I posted a picture of me having pizza, which oh. I never have. I mean, never. But like people are like, I thought you were gluten free. And I'm like, first off, it's einkorn wheat probably. And everything is so fresh and different over there, but it's just, I, we're not perfect. So just to make Thank everybody. Goodness. Thank goodness we're not perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I've loved being on your show. By the way, every time I've worked with any of your producers, they've been fantastic. I am so impressed every time I go there, just how well things are run. You guys always have things that are so interactive that I think, and I think that's why the show has been so successful so long, is that it's so engaging. You guys are always changing things up. Things are interesting. Things are impactful. What are some of your favorite shows or episodes you've done over the past I mean, how long have you been on? 15 years or how many, how many years has it been? I've been doing my show 11 years. I did Oprah's show six years before that. So, okay. uh, you know, a total of 17 years, which believe me, again, I, I'm going to say it again. This is not part of my vision board. I had no <laughs> desire to do that. In fact, when I first started doing it, I would dress up in, in my nice suit to fly to Chicago to be with Oprah. And then I get in these scrubs. They change the color of the Columbia scrubs, by the way. They're, they're, they, they made it this puke color because they don't want people stealing them. Oh, it my was gosh. Beautiful baby blue. Like your shirt, actually. Yeah. Uh, that I, but uh, I would just put those on because I don't want to get my, my suit dirty. That's how little I understood about media. But favorite episodes, I'll tell you, they, maybe my first episode ever with Oprah where I was talking about how the intestines work. And I had, I had intestines that I had brought in there from my, our, our autopsy lab at Columbia. And I was explaining to her how bowel works and the fact that we all pass gas. And then I had a thought. I said, okay, let me just try this. We'll see if it's going to work as, a, as, a, as an opportunity. I'm going to say, I'm going to admit that I have passed gas since I've been on this show because the average person passes once an hour. So we've been on about an hour. So I, I remember passing gas. I'm, 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 I admit it. And I said, the audience most likely has passed gas. How many of you have done that? Awkward yeses. And then I said, I bet our host has passed gas. Oh, my God. I started to laugh and laugh. And I knew we'd have a great friendship because she could honor her truth. And I, and I think that's part of the coolness of television when it's done right is you actually commit, can create those moments that people can resonate to and remember. I mean, even now, all these years later, people remember that episode, the S-shaped poop dropping into the water, and the epiphany that, oh my goodness, if it's not shaped in a, you know, like an S or a comma or something, some letter, some punctuation, that I'm not actually pooping the right way. Maybe I'm constipated mm. or I have diarrhea. And so these sort of self-check moments were important. My show, I spent a lot of time getting into people's lives and try to, like, do what a doctor does, you know, open you up so you can hear different wisdom. I had a whole series of shows with Charlie Sheen, which I know people will find strange that I pick him, but we really got into why Charlie was doing the things he was doing. Incredibly bright, high IQ uh, gentleman who uh, in, in remarkably talented in so many areas, but flawed obviously in others. And you know, did he have mania with manic depressive disorder? Was there something else going on that would push him into these, uh, these fits of frustration? Uh, that's what I spent a lot of time trying to work through. But because it happened on television, everyone experienced it together. And so it got people on track. Right now I'm doing a whole series of shows with Dog, the bounty hunter, who's a, just a superstar of a guy, just lost his wife, Beth, very down because of that. He called me from the hospital. Actually, he did. This team called on him. They were telling on him because he was signing out of the hospital AMA, against medical advice. And I just love going. He said, if you come here, I'll consider going back and getting taken care of. So I flew to Chicago. I flew to Colorado, took, we got him back to the hospital. We got him managed. But you sort of start to realize how fragile people are, as bright as they may be. Here's bounty, you know, the bounty hunter, right, dog, who's actually running away from the medical law. He's on, you know, I'm the bounty hunter looking for him now because he's running away from doctors who are trying to save his life. And that's how so many people are. And politicians that I've had on, all the famous celebrities that I've ever had, it's always the same basic story. We are all flawed in, in fascinating ways. 
whenever that, that flaw becomes exposed and can be treated or healed, I feel good about the show. Yeah. That's awesome. I love hearing the story about Oprah as well. She, uh, again, I remember watching all the way back then and I was so impressed. You and I think Dr. Phil do, do what? Well, I know I'm 30. Yeah. I was young. I was very young. My, my mom watches, watch it. My mom is like your typical, my mom is, uh, she is 67 and, uh, man, you know, she, she's been in a natural health for years. She loves going to seminars. She loves using her Vitamix and anyways. Good oh, yeah. oh yeah. Yeah. All right, let's talk about, we've talked about food. We've talked about emotions and stress, which I know that's another thing I love about you is you're looking at every part of the body that can affect our health. Let's talk a little about activity personally. I mean, do you specifically have any hobbies or anything like that you and Lisa or the kids love to do? Yeah, we, we're, we're very competitive. Uh, we, we play, <laughs> even charades is full contact for us. <laughs> so, all the kids were raised on Oz Olympics where we would, have to compete, and each child would have an activity that we knew they were pretty good at. They had to earn it, and then they had to beat their siblings at that activity, and then hopefully, you know, grab a victory from one of their siblings' domains. Um, but what do I, you know, day, do day to day? It's pretty straightforward. I, I do yoga almost every day, but not not a ton. Again, it's mostly a stretching exercise, down dog, up dog, a sun salutation type practice. Uh, a couple of times a week, I'll get on an elliptical or treadmill, and I'll run. Um, and I do that because I've got to watch a lot of video for the show, so I can actually watch stuff while I'm running. Uh, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm outdoors, if I have a place where I can run outdoors, I'll always prefer that. But my favorite thing to do is to play sports with the family. So whether it's tennis, basketball, whatever I can do. I played this year in the NBA Celebrity All-Star Game. Yeah. And it was my, my second appearance. But the last one was 10 years ago, the first year of the show. And I played in the uh, Major League Baseball Celebrity All-Star Game. So I like playing those kinds of events, mainly because I, I try to say, listen, as old as I am, and I'm 59 now, and I'm not as good as these studs, but I'm competitive. And the reason that's important is most of us forget that we are designed for endurance. And the, if you look at the New York Marathon finishing times for 17-year-olds, they're about the same as they are for 55-year-olds, which Crazy. means... We're designed to keep going for long periods. Now, I can't jump as high as a 27-year-old and run as quickly as, a, as a, someone in their 20s. So I'm not a sprinter anymore. But I can keep up with younger people anyway for quite a long time because our ancestors endurance hunted. They didn't outrun the cheetah and stab it. You know, they out endured the antelope. So when the antelope got tired because they couldn't run any further, we'd run over it because they'd fallen over by it, basically. Stab and eat it. Wow. No, I love that too. Yeah. The, uh, it's, I used to do triathlons all the time. And so it was amazing that, yeah, so the guys in their fifties, how much endurance they had, it always kind of blew me away. I mean, even, even from a competitive standpoint, you're looking at the guy's times, you're like, wow, it's, it's amazing. Well, one of the last things I wanted to ask you, you know, we were talking about the mission trip earlier. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I mean, how, how much around your life or the reason why you do the show or the reason why you went into medicine, how much of that revolves around mission for you? I mean, do you have a personal mission? I do. You know, my mother-in-law is a minister. My wife went to theology school. Oh, I had no idea. Wow. And um, I, you know, my, Lisa and I started a foundation called Health Corps 16 years ago. And it's like the Peace Corps. But instead of teaching young people how to go off to Botswana to build dams, we teach college grads about going into high schools around America and teaching teens, like big brothers and big sisters. Yeah. They mentor these young folks. And I, you know, I'm on the President's Commission now for uh, fitness and nutrition. It is amazing what a shortage we have in coaches in America. And just to be able to get people into the communities to chip in, to, to provide a, a, a hand up, not a hand out, a hand up to a lot of these young folks in underserved areas is incredibly fulfilling and they desperately need it. So I'm passionate about that. I've always told my staff that our audience are the folks who don't have insurance or adequate insurance. They're the ones who don't have a relationship with their doctor. Those are the ones who really need us to give them good advice so they can mentor and doctor themselves, at least until they find the right kind of relationship where a real professional can manage them day to day. And so we got to get it right. It's vital. Um, but it works when we do it right. It's, uh, it's, it's special. I love that. I love that. Well, I want to say thanks so much for coming. I know how busy you are. You've got, you know, you've got patients waiting. And, and, and first of all, it blows me away how you do everything you do from the show, which is a big production. Like I, when the first time I went in, I was like, I can't believe the amount of cameras, the amount of people it makes, but it makes sense to put on such an amazing show. Uh, how many hands need to be on deck, but also between everything else you do with, you know, 
be, being with your family and being at the hospital. But anyways, just uh, congratulations. I want to say thanks for having me on uh, the show in the past. And thanks for your great advice and wisdom. God bless you. I look forward to having you on many more times. And I look forward to having you on my podcast too. It's been a lot of fun. I can't wait. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, everybody. Hey, well, Josh. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. The products and ingredients discussed in this podcast are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. If you believe you may have a medical condition, please consult your doctor. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guests' qualifications or credibility. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.